Masechet Sota, Daf Lamed Gimel. The Mishnah mentioned various recitations that can be said in any language, including Tefillah, praying, praying the Amida. Let's explain why. Rachamehi kol hechi deba'e mesaleh, because the purpose of prayer is to request mercy from HaKadosh Baruch Hu. And therefore, one can request mercy. It's all about intention of the heart, and therefore, one can pray in every, in any language. Utfila uh, bechol lashon, and now we ask, is that true? Can you really pray in every language? Veha amar Rav Yehuda, lo'lam al yishal adam sarachah belashon aramit, da'amar bi Yohanan, kol ha'shol sarachah belashon arami, en malachi asharet niskakin lo, lefi she'en malachi asharet makilin belashon arami. Rav Yehuda said that a person should not request his needs, pray for mercy, in Aramaic. It's not clear if he means um, it should only be in Hebrew, um, uh, or that, or if he means that um, it should just not be in Aramaic. Aramaic is out, but any other language is okay. Um, and the reason is because Rabbi Yochanan says anyone who uh, requests his needs in Aramaic, the angels will not attend tend to that prayer because the angels do not understand Aramaic. So it depends on this. Do the angels only not understand Aramaic? Maybe something wrong with Aramaic is too similar to Hebrew, so they get confused. Or do they all not understand any language? They only understand Hebrew. Um, anyway, the Aramaic was the main spoken language um, at the at the time of the Talmud, and so this was the this was the lingua franca. So that would be the the language that one that people understood. That would be the language that they would say. Um, so anyway, certainly Hebrew is better because the angels certainly understand Hebrew, and they do not understand Aramaic, and maybe they don't understand any other languages either. And therefore, one should pray in Hebrew only. Otherwise, we won't have the help of the angels. And we answer la kashya habiachid habesibur when our Mishnah says that. One can pray in uh, in any language, including in Aramaic. That's talking about as a community, because when you have communal prayer, when you have a minyan together, then the Shekhinah is there directly, and we don't need the intercession of the angels. And Hashem knows every language. Hashem knows the minds and hearts of, of every person. And therefore, any language is okay. However, when one is praying uh, individually, then a Shekhinah is not as close, and one requires the intercession, the help of the angels, and the angels understand Hebrew, but not Aramaic, and therefore, one should, one, one should pray in Hebrew. Uh, Shulchan Aruch, in fact, uh, says, his, the, the first opinion of Shulchan Aruch is precisely this, um, that one, one can pray in any language when, um, uh, when you're with a community, uh, but uh, individually, one should pray in Hebrew. Um, this is a bit problematic according to Rambam and others who say that it's prohibited to pray to an angel or any uh, heavenly body or anything else besides HaKadosh Baruch Hu. Rambam adds one also should not pray for the help of an angel uh, to help out on his behalf. So this intercession of the angels um, is, is, is a big question according to Rambam. And uh, therefore, um, Shulchan Aruch then brings other uh, opinions that says even biyachid one can pray in other languages and so I'm uh, it seems that those the yesh omrim in Shulchan Aruch would make more sense uh, according to the philosophy of Rambam that says Hashem can hear everything directly from a person even biyachid and therefore according to the yesh omrim in Shulchan Aruch an individual also can pray in any language. All right, now that we mentioned this, the angels, is that true that the angels don't know Aramaic? Here's a couple of stories. This is John Herkinus, the Hasmonean Kohen Gadol. He heard a, a voice, a divine voice, and we're assuming that this divine voice is, is, from, a, is from an angel. It's not God's direct voice. Um, and it, it, it came from Kodesh Kodashim, and it said in Aramaic, the youth who went to wage war in Antochia, um, up, up north in Turkey, have been victorious. This is referring to an incident that Josephus also tells us about. Uh, John Hyrcanus, he went and wanted to conquer the, the north, Samaria. Uh, of Israel, and he did successfully. Um, he sent his sons to go and fight 
um, up there he, to fight the Samaritans. Right, Samaritans are remnants of the northern ten tribes, uh, mixed in with other peoples um, that were uh, uh, often at odds, and um, they are not. They don't consider themselves Jewish because Jewish means Yehuda. Yehuda is the south. The Samaritans are the north. And so they were at odds and often at war, um, but with uh, with the Jews. And when John Hyrcanus was uh, able to have gain power, he went and conquered the north. He destroyed the Samaritan temple. The Samaritans had Antiochus on their side. And uh, meanwhile, Yochanan was in the Bet Mikdash, and he heard a voice. Josephus also mentions this heavenly voice that came from the Kodesh Kodashim that says that said that. Um, his sons and the Jewish army succeeded in conquering the Samaritans. And that was said in Aramaic. Another story. And another story that happened in the time of Shimon Hasadik. Uh, now Shimon Hasadik uh, lived um, early in the middle of the second Beta Mikdash, like uh, you know, third century BCE. Um, so that is a problem for the uh, the uh, the people mentioned in the continuation. Uh, Gas Calgas probably refers to the emperor Caligula, um, who who lived uh, much later. So it's not clear who the Shimon Asadik was is, um, but in any case, this is referring to another story that we also know from Josephus um, and also from Migilat Ta'anit. And this story is about Caligula. His name means uh, little boots because when he was uh, little, they, they dressed him in little boots, so he was kind of cute. But there's nothing cute about him. He was a crazy, insane, evil uh, emperor, one of the worst. And uh, as, as Emperor Caligula wanted to put a statue of himself in the Bet HaMikdash and force everybody to serve him. And this was going to cause a huge uproar. Uh, the Roman commissioner delayed carrying her out because they knew that the Jews would rather die. Uh, then, uh, then, then worship this uh, uh, statue of Caligula, and it was going to cause a huge uh, revolution, a war, a big problem. Uh, thankfully, Caligula was killed in Rome, and his decree was annulled uh, before this, uh, but before it was done, before the statue was installed. And so here the story is that Shimon Asadik, whoever it was, whoever this Kohen Gadol was, maybe a different Shimon. Um, it was in the Bet HaMikdash and heard a bat call from Kodesh Kodashim saying that the decree that the enemy intended to bring against the temple is annulled and Caligula has been killed, his decrees have been voided. At that time, the people wrote down exactly the date and time that they heard this voice and then, sure enough, they heard me the messengers came from Rome saying that Cal Caligula died and they looked at exactly what time it was and they saw that the bat call told them the news instantly that they only heard later from messengers. Uh, anyway, the point of this story is that this batkol was also in Aramaic. So you see that angels do speak Aramaic. How come you said up there that they don't? First answer is a bad call is different um, because that's to communicate a message to human beings. So if it's a bad call going from uh, heaven to mankind, that can speak Aramaic. That's a bad call. That's different from angels. Angels who are receiving prayers and interpreting them and bringing them up to HaKadosh Baruch Hu, that's the other way around. So um, the bat call does not work through angels. Um, that's just a message from heaven to earth, and the bat call can speak Aramaic. Angels um, receiving prayers cannot. The second answer is that this is Gavriel. Most angels do not know Aramaic, except for Gavriel, because there's another Midrash that Gavriel came and taught Yosef 70 languages. If Yosef is going to be uh, important and second in command in all of Egypt, he's going to have to speak many languages. And Gavriel taught him. So therefore, you see that Gavriel does know, the language, does know lang all the languages, including Aramaic. And so this bat call is from Gavriel, um, but 
most prayers are not going to go necessarily through Gabriel, and that's why the other angels do not know Aramaic, and that's why they cannot interpret the prayers. All right, fascinating discussion. Now we go to the next item. Berkat Amazon can be said in any language. Dichti v'achalta v'sabata uberachta et Adonai Elohecha bechol lashon shatam evarech. Once you eat and are satiated, you have to bless God. Bless God in any language that 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 you bless. A blessing is a blessing, no matter what the language is. And it's good to un- understand what one is saying. If someone sins and hears a the, the voice of an oath, right? The oath of the other person that says, Do you swear that you don't know any testimony about this case? And he says, Yes, I swear. I don't know any testimony about that case. Um, and it turns out he's lying. He actually did know testimony, um, but he was withholding the testimony that he knew. So he has to bring a Korban, and uh, this it will be true no matter what language, whatever language he heard that oath in, and he said, Yes, I agree to that oath, he is liable. So, why? Because it says he heard the oath. As long as he heard it, it doesn't matter what language. And the same is true regarding a deposit. If uh, someone says, Hey, do you swear that you don't have my deposit? That I, I, I gave you to, to, uh, to, to watch for me. He says, I swear, I don't have that. I don't have anything from, from you. And turns out he's lying. That also he will be liable to bring a korban, no matter what language that oath was taken. And we learned that from a Gezer Shavas, his techeta regarding Shavat Edut that we just saw. And also his techeta regarding this, Shavuat Pikadon. Okay, now we finished the list of the thing, items in the Mishnah that can be said in any language, and now we start the list of items that have to be said in Hebrew. We start off with a paragraph-long quote from the Mishnah. So the first item on the list was Mikra Bikurim. The second one was the conversation that happens during Chalitza. And then the Mishnah goes on and says, Mikra Bikurim. All right, what's the source for that? That has to be in Hebrew. It says, Ve'anita, ve'amarta. Lifnei Adonai lo'hecha, olano omer, ve'anu halvim ve'amaru el kol ish Yisrael. Ma'an yamura lehalan b'lshon ha'kodesh, afkan b'lshon ha'kodesh. The Mishnah already taught that we learn a Gezerah Shava. It uses a double language to speak up and say regarding Bikurim and regarding the Berachot and Kelalot, the Leviim are going to pronounce the Berachot and it says speak up and say double language. And just like the Berachot and Kelalot on Har Gerizim and Har Eval have to be pronounced by the Leviim in Hebrew, so too Mikra um, Bikurim, that the farmer, when he brings his first fruit, says the recitation, it has to be in Hebrew. Good. Ulvim kufayu minelan. Now, I understand you learned that Mikra Bikurim has to be in Hebrew because the Levim say the Berachot and Kelot in Hebrew. But how do you know that they have to say the Berachot and Kelot in Hebrew? Atya kol, kol mi Moshe. Ketiv hacha kol ram, uchdiv atam, atam, Moshe yedaber, v'ha'elohim ya'anenu bekol. Ma lehalan belshon ha'kodesh, afkan belshon ha'kodesh. So that the Levim have to say Berachot and Kelot in Hebrew. That itself is learned from another Gezer Shava from the word kol, that's said regarding Levim and regarding Moshe at Matan Torah. So it says, on the one hand, kol ram, uh, that the blessings and curses will be said in a loud voice. And regarding Moshe, it says Moshe would speak and God would respond to him in a big voice. Not clear what that means. It, you know, you'd expect to, to to say Hashem spoke and then Moshe repeated. Here it seems to be the other way around. Uh, one interpretation is that Moshe would speak, but his voice is not so loud. You need everyone on the bottom of the mountain to be able to hear him. So instead, this means that Hashem would be like an amplifier, like a speaker. Um, Hashem taught Moshe the the the, the, the Torah, the eight the eight commandments besides the first two, and Moshe said them, but then Hashem amplified his voice so that everybody could hear it. So over there, surely the Ten Commandments were given in Hebrew, um, and therefore also here the Berachot and Kelalot, it also says Kol, have to be said in Hebrew. Good. Next item. Chalisa Kesad V'chuleh V'rabanan Hai Kacha Mai Abid le. Now, regarding Chalitza, there were two different opinions about how we know that Chalitza has to be in Hebrew. Uh, one opinion said 
It's from the double language, Ve'aneta Ve'amera, which we already saw that in regarding Bikurim, uh, uses the double language and therefore has to be said in Hebrew, so so to Chalitza, that's the double language. That was the opinion of Rabbanan. However, Rabbi Yehuda said, no, no, it's from the word Kacha, Ve'aneta Ve'amera, Kacha Ye'aseh La'ish, Kacha means precisely, exactly with this language, means it has to be in Hebrew. Okay, good. So now that we know that, we ask Rabbanan, what are you, what are you going to learn from that word Kacha? Um, since you already know that it has to be in Hebrew from Vanita Amira. And the answer is, This teaches that anything that is an action, like removing the shoe or spitting, those are two actions. Those are necessary for the chalitza ceremony to be valid, as opposed to the recitation, right? The, the things that they have to say, uh, that the, 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 she has to say, right? She, she's refusing. The things that they, that they say in the conversation, although it's a mitzvah, one should say them, but let's say you didn't. Let's say they did the whole uh, ceremony. Uh, all the actions, but they were quiet the whole time and didn't say anything, it is still valid. So that's what he learns but from, from Kacha, Yeh this must be done, that the actions are absolutely required. Where are you going to learn that the actions are indispensable? He's going to learn it from the fact that it says, not just, it could have said, Ko, Kacha is longer, and another, an extra letter. So from that extra letter, he can learn um, two things from this word. That has to be in Hebrew, right? Kacha, and also that the the actions are indispensable. So he's going to learn two things from this one word. Rabbanan says, I'm not going to learn anything from an extra letter. I don't think you do. Uh, you can learn anything from an extra letter. And that's why he learns Kacha, that you only learn one thing from it that it has to be that the actions are necessary and from there has to be in Hebrew he learns from Anetave Amera. What is he going to do with this double language Aneta and Amera since he already knows that it has to be Hebrew from Kacha so this is extra. Oh so he is actually going to go the other way around. He's going to say, Anetav Amera is here so that we can make a Gezer Shavah to the Berachot and Kelalot. Just as regarding um, Chalitza, that has to be in Hebrew. We know that from Kacha. And it uses a double language, Anetav Amera. And so that has to be in Hebrew. That's the source from which we derive that the Berachot and Kelalot, Ve'anu Halevi'im Ve'amiru, that has a double language that also has to be in Hebrew. Whereas for the Rabbanan, it was the other way around. They had the Berachot and Kelot as the source. They've had over there from Kol. Um, so according to the Rabbanan, Kol is said regarding Moshe. He said the Ten Commandments in Hebrew. And therefore Berachot and Kelot, says Kol. And that has to be in Hebrew. It says the double verb there. And Berachot and Kelot. And so that's the source to learn too. Chalitza. Whereas for the Biuda, it's the other way around. The arrow points the other way around. Kacha, that's where we learn that, that um, Chalitza has to be in Hebrew. And then there's a double language, double verb there. Anu v'alvim v'amiru, also berachot kelalot. And so we learn that berachot and kelalot have to be in Hebrew the other way around. So now we ask, Ve'lelaf kol mi Moshe. By the Biuda, what are you going to do with the uh, Gezra Shava of kol that you have from Moshe, right? So what do you need? What, that's, that's now extra. And the answer is, Aniya, Aniya gamir. Kol kol la gamir. He learned a gezera shava between the two the, the two verbs of aniya and aniya, um, but he never learned a gezera shava comparing kol to kol. You can understand this that he didn't learn it from his teachers, and there's a rule gezera shava. You have to uh, you can't make it up. It has to learn be learned from the teachers, and it also makes sense here because kol is kind of a, a very common word, and the more common the word, so you can't make a gezera shava on every common word. Aniya is a less common word. So it makes sense that he would say that um, it, that he wouldn't, one should make this Gezerah Shavah for Aniyah, but he rejects the Kavachom, the Gezerah Shavah from Kol to Kol. And that's why he has to learn it the other way around from 
Kacha to Aniyah, and Aniyah goes to Berachot and Kelalot. Tanya na Mehachi, we have a Beraita that supports um, Rabbi Yehuda, what, what we just said about Rabbi Yehuda. Rabbi Yehuda Omer, Kol Makom Shnemar, Kol Kacha Aniyah v'Amira, Eno Ela Lashon HaKodesh, Kol Kotev Arichu, Kacha Dechalisa, Aniyah v'Amira, Dilvim. Rabbi Yehuda says, if, and anytime you see language that says either Kol or Kacha, or the double language including Aniyah, that means it has to be in Hebrew. And each of these refers to a specific example. Ko, kote barichu, regarding birkat koanim, has to be said in Hebrew. Kacha, that's chalisa, has to be said in Hebrew. And aniyav amira, that teaches that the leviyim have to say the berachot and kelalot in Hebrew. So you see this supports exactly the um, explanation that we gave for the Behuda above. Next, Berachot and Uklalot Kesad. Keban Shabru Yisrael Tayaden Vechule. The Mishnah gave a long description of how they uh, uh, how they perform the Berachot and Kelalot on Har Gerizim and Har Eval, six and six. Tenura Banan. Halo Hema Be'ayver Hayarden. Me'ayver Layaden Ve'elach. Tibre Rebi Yehuda. Achare Derech Mevoa Shemesh. Makom She Hachama Zorachat. We're now going to see a machloket between two opinions about where exactly is um, uh, 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 Had Gerizim and Had Aival. Here is the Pasuk. It says, Okay, so we know that they are in the land of Israel. Where exactly are there? Pasuk tells us. Right, B'nai Sel at this time were on the eastern side of the Jordan. So Moshe is telling them it's going to be on the other side of the Jordan right, when you go in with Yehoshua. Achare derech mevo Hashemesh, beyond the west road. Uh, so here mevo Hashemesh is understood as where the sun sets. We're going to see because ba Hashemesh could also mean where the sun comes from, from the east. Um, so, uh, so, but the Peshat sounds like it's past the west road. Um, Be'ez Kena'an, uh, Kena'ani, in the land of the Kena'an, Hayosheb Araba, in the Arava area, in the plain, near Gilgal, near Elone More. So now the question is, where exactly is this place? We will see two opinions. Uh, the opinion of Rabbi Yehuda, which is also reflected in the Mishnah, is that it's the same as Shechem. Uh, we're going to see Gezer Shavat with Abraham, it was, was already quoted in the Mishnah. Um, so it's over here in Shechem, here's the Jordan River, here's Shechem. Um, and we're going to we're going to uh, interpret the pasuk in this way. However, we're about to see another opinion of Rabbi El Azar, who says, "No, no, Har Gerizim and Har Eval are not near Shechem; they're closer to the Jordan River." If you see on this map, Shechem is actually kind of in the middle of uh, Eretz Yisrael. It's quite far from the Jordan River. So, right, had to get all the way there um, in a, such a short time. It doesn't make sense. And so, according to Rabbi El Azar, the description in this Pasuk in Devarim makes more sense that it's not near Shechem, but rather more east, close to the Jordan River. Um, so let's see how each of these opinions interprets the Pesukim. Okay, um, so here's a Badaita. Um, so these are um, on the other side of the Jordan. Um, so not just right, it's not, doesn't mean right on the other side of the Jordan, but rather Ba'elach, much further beyond the other side of the Jordan, right? That's why it says, way beyond, according to the Biuda. How's the Biuda going to explain the rest of the Pasuk? Well, when it says um, on the, uh, the, 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 the far side of where the sun uh, of the coming of the sun, behind the way of the coming of the sun, that refers to the east where the sun rises. In other words, they, uh, Jordan River is at the east, but the Harevan and Har Gerizim are further away from the east. They're all the way west. Beres HaKenani Arava. We're continuing how to, with the way that Rabbi Uda explains the Pasuk. Elu Har Gerizim Har Ibal Shoshpin Bahem Kutiyim. They are in the land of the Canaanites. In the Araba area, that's Had Gerizim Had Ger Had Geba Had Had Ebal. Now the Canaanites, in a uh, uh, long time ago, in, in uh, Moshe's times, uh, the Cana the Canaani was there. But during the time of the the second Beit Hamikdash, the Kutim, meaning the Samaritans, now live there. Mul Ha Gilgal Samuch La Gilgal. So that means near Gilgal. 
uh, Esel Elone More, and where is Elone More near Elone More? That is Shechem. How do you know Elone More is Shechem? Well, Lano Merve, Abor Abram, Baadis, and Makum Shechem, Ad Elon More, Ma Elon More, Amor Lahan Shechem, Afkan Shechem. Regarding Abraham, it says he went to Elon More, which is very, very similar to Elone More. I'm assuming that's the same the same place. Regarding Abraham, it says uh, that is Shechem. Uh, so to Shechem, to Elon More. So Shechem and Elon More are either identical or very close to each other. So to here in uh, Devarim, Elon More must mean near Shechem. Uh, good. So all that is going to the Biuda. Now Tanya. Now, continuing with the opinion of Rabbi Yehuda, and based on that, Rabbi Elazar, uh, the son of Rabbi Yosef, said, in this, regarding this matter, I proved that the books of the Kutiyim are forged. This is talking about the Samaritan Pentateuch. Uh, the Samaritans have their own version of the Chumash. Samaritans deny the oral Torah Shabal Peh. They also deny Nevi'im and Ketuvim because they believe that the holiest city, the capital of Israel, is up north in the, in the Shomron. That's where they built their temple. Near near Shechem, um, and uh, their sources. Well, Had Gerizim. That's the Had Beracha. So that must be where the temple should be built, and that's where they built their their Bet Hamikdash. Um, so therefore, they have to reject Nevi'im and Kituvim because all over Nevi'im and Kituvim talk about Yerushalayim, and the Chumash never does not mention Yerushalayim. Chumash says Amakom Shedib Chad Hashem, the place that God will choose, wherever that will be. That will be the holy place. So the Samaritans are fine with the Chumash because they interpret the place that God will choose to be um, Har Girizim, where uh, that's up in the north. So it makes sense that the Samaritans, who are remnants of the northern ten tribes who lived in the north, would not want to recognize Yerushalayim in the south as the capital, and therefore they said it's in the north. And that's why they have to reject Nevi'im and Ketuvim. Okay, but furthermore, the Samaritans add in a few things in their Chumash. We have their uh, their Chumash now. Um, we have manuscripts of it. Um, it's, you can find it printed and you can compare it side by side. And you can see that they forged a few things in order to uphold their opinion. Um, and this here is one of them. Amarti lahem ziyaftem toratchem velo aditem biyatchem kelum shatem odim omrim elone more shechem afanu modim shelone more shechem anu lemadnuha begezra shava atem bame limadatum. And so the Bielazar spoke to the Samaritans. Apparently there was dialogue and and uh, debate between them. And he said, "You guys, you forged your Torah and you got no benefit from it." If you're going to forge your Torah, at least, you know, get some, get something out of it. But you went, you added a word to your Torah, and there's no, you, with, with, with no point, because you say that Elone More is Shechem, and that's what they added in. In this Pasuk in Devarim, they say Elone More Shechem. They add in the word Shechem, so that you know Elone More is up in the north, where they say it is. But, but the, the Rabbi Elazar, Rabbi Elazar says, we agree that Elone More is in, is Shechem, right? And we learned it from a Gezer Shava regarding Avraham. So you don't need to add a word to it. You can learn it from a Gezer Shava. Now, of course, the rabbis can learn from a Gezer Shava because they have the, they have the, the methods of Midrash. But you guys, you Kutiyim, you deny the oral law and you deny this possibility of interpretation. So what's your source? You don't have a source. Um, you don't have a way to derive it. All you do is forge your Torah and stick the word right in. This is a very powerful uh, uh, insult against the Samaritans, and it is an accurate uh, insult the Samaritan Pentateuch does, in fact, um, in uh, this and other cases, add in words. In other cases, it does have a substantive change, um, so it's, you know, it, it it has a uh, has a use. It just happens to be wrong. Here, not only is it a forgery, it also has no use because we all everyone agrees that that is Shechem. Right? Everybody agrees that Shechem is a holy place. Hadigidizim is a holy place, and that's where it was. Right? This, uh, that we think that the uh, ultimate capital and the and the where the Beit Hamikdash is going to be is Yerushalayim. All right, Rabbi Elazar Amar. All that was Rabbi Uda, who does say 
that the Har uh, Gedezim is near Shechem. However, the Biel Hazar Amar Halo Hema Be'ayved Hayarden Samuch Layarden. He says, no, it can't be all the way in Shechem. If it says on the other side of the Jordan, it means right over the Jordan, near the Jordan. Because according to you, the uh, Biuda, it says that when you pass over the Jordan, you're going to write the Torah on stones and you're going to take the stones with you. How are you going, how are you going to carry the stones all the way so far inland? And, right, it makes much more sense that you would come right over the Jordan, and that's the place as talking about had Gerizim, had Aival have to be right near, and that's where you're setting up the stones. It says you're going to set up the stones on had Aival, right when you cross over the Jordan. So it makes sense it's nearby. And then when it says, by the way of the coming of the sun, I interpret that to mean where the sun sets, meaning it's in the west. Right over the on the western side of the of the Jordan, but not near, not all the way down to Shechem. Beres Hakenani Eres Chivihi, and it says Eres Kenani. According to Ruyu the Bihuda, Eres the the Shechem is in the land of Chivi, so it should have said Eres Chivi. But according to my interpretation, near the Jordan, that's called Eres Kenani. So it says in the Arava means in the plain. So according to you, Shechem, Shechem is on the mountain range. So that then it should be among the mountains and hills. But it's not. Uh, uh, but um, uh, but uh, so but Shechem is Shechem is under the uh, by the mountains and hills. But the Torah says Arava. So Arava is a better description for the area of the plain near the Jordan. Mul HaGilgal Lora Uta Gilgal. It says near Gilgal, but Shechem is far from Gilgal. You can't even see Gilgal from Shechem. But according to my interpretation, Gilgal is in fact near the Jordan River. That's where Har Gerizim and Har Eval are far from uh, far from Shechem. It could be the Biel Azad also has a bone to pick with the Samaritans. And uh, the Samaritans, they say, oh, Shechem is so important, right? And that's where Har is. So he can say, no, it was never even there in the first place. Um, Har Gerizim is actually not where you think. It's closer to the Jordan, not near Shechem, where you guys, you Samaritans, built your temple. And in that case, right, the Samaritans, it makes sense that they would have to forge their uh, Torah to say, oh, it's the Shechem, that's where we think it is. Um, so according to that, their forgery is useful, although although still a false forgery. Rabbi Eliezer ben Yaakov Omer, Lo ba'a katuv ela leharot lahen derech bashiniya, kederech shara lahen bari shona. Rabbi Eliezer ben Yaakov, not, not the same as Rabbi Elazar above, um, he says a different interpretation of this pasuk, that is coming to give them directions of how they should travel um, in the second the second generation, just like in the first generation where they had the clouds and the pillar of fire showing the Bnei Israel where they should travel. And so too, Hashem is giving them directions like ways. Listen, when you go into the land, this is how you should travel. Derech. You should always travel by the road. Don't go in the middle of fields and vineyards. Stay on the main road. Hayoshib beishub lechol velo ba midbarot. Hayoshib, you should always go in the settled area. As then you always have access to food and drink. Um, if you need, and don't go in the middle of the desert. That's not not a good idea to travel in the desert. But like not like they did in the first. And well, in the first day generation, they had man and all that to help them out. But now they have to be self sustaining. Barava barava lechu velo beharim ugvaot. And you should always go in the plain and don't go over mountains and hills. Right? It might seem shorter as the crow flies, but it's much harder to travel if you have to go up and up and down mountains and hills. So when you travel, you should go through the Arava. Baruch Adonai Amen ve'amen.